man to man Combat hand to hand, horns locked Ready for the last stand, elbow drops, kicks fade bang If I connect you, levitate, better settle mate Lights out, knocked out by the heavyweight Hi, it's Toby from Heavyweight MMA Today I'm with a woman who's hard to tie down From when she's young, her parents had trouble tying her down I've had trouble tying her down for an interview But she's here, rising MMA star, the wild one, Michelle Montague How are you today? Good, yeah, good, good, good How are you? Good, good. Just finished training this morning. Yeah. Oh, so it's nine thirty p.m. now. So yeah, I've just gotten back since this morning. I've gotten back now. Yeah. Sorry, I'm confused with the times. We're in different parts of the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Heavy day or? Uh yeah. Had sparring from eleven a.m. Uh, and then had strength and conditioning from two p.m. and then had uh, drilling from seven p.m. Crazy, crazy. That's the the schedule of a professional fighter, right? <laughs> That's apparently it. <laughs> That's it. Anyway, um, fresh off your PFL win, uh, congratulations on that first fight. I uh, got a nice rear naked choke in the first round. Must be very happy with that, right? Yeah, I was very happy with that. Because, um, like, that's, I mean, although you can fault yourself with so many things throughout it, like, big picture-wise, you want, you're imagining that feeling of winning and, you know, ideally coming out um, injury-free. And then to, to manage to do that was like, oh, fuck, that felt so good. That's awesome. Um, so you just mentioned that you fault yourself on on some things. Out of interest, what do you fault yourself on in that fight? Um, got a bit like casual with the hand height. <laughs> just, she got she got one uh one little lead hook there through. I mean, obviously didn't do any damage, but it, like with somebody else, maybe it would or whatever. So just like just being more um more vigilant with that there. Um would have been good to have the body triangle around her. She did have her weight on my leg so much to the point on that side that I couldn't fight without adjusting and moving over. And I thought I had it on enough, but again, if you wanted to get technical, she could have maybe roll, spun around on my legs there. Um, yeah, but apart from that, you know, it was um, fine for a pro debut, you know. No, it's good. I mean, the, Olivia Parker, right? She she had a few more fights than you professionally, so. I think you can't really ask for a better outcome, but it's good that you're approaching it with a, you know, with a critical eye because that's how you're going to get better, right? I absolutely, yeah, for sure. So, you know, I'm interested in how it felt to be fighting in the PFL. Obviously, quite a big production. Previously, you'd fought in um, <clears throat> mostly IMMAF and I had yep. one listed from Shuriken as well. What's the difference between those couple of um, associations and, and um, how did it feel like? Uh, indifference being in that pro sort of level yeah so shuriken i mean they put on a, an amazing production but it's always going to feel like home because you are at home you're in new zealand friends and family you know everyone there um you know the organized like it, it that's going to feel always kind of home anyway no matter how big the stage is uh for it but the imfs i mean i think the imfs prepares you for your professional career like the best out of any any way you could possibly want to prep for professional ranks um when we run out on even just the european champs or whether or whether it's the world champs especially especially when they're in uh the uae somewhere um the amount of production and money they they plug into that is insane so you run out you're on the stage there's freaking like fireworks going up and stuff and uh and the uh, and, but it, it, as long as you can't, there's a lot of noise going on, but it's still to the point where it's not a full stadium. You can hear your corner. So it was, it was, it's a, it was almost like a hybrid having the PFL in that sense. Well, you know, how we did it in a closed studio. Um, you know, you could hear a fucking pin drop. Um, so you could definitely hear your coaches and the, and the other corners coaches as well. Um, but still the, 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 the feeling of going out there with the cameras in there, at least with the iMac, you get pretty used to it, but still nothing like will fully prepare you for it, for it until you are there. I mean, I'm sure like every fight I have after this, I'm going to have that same little feeling before I go out of like, ooh, that's that feeling. <laughs> hey, just out of interest, um, you've trained uh, extensively in, or a lot in New Zealand, but also in the States. Who was in your corner for those, uh, for the last fight for PFL? Was it someone from, from ATT? Yeah, so I had Carla Meister from Core MMA, uh, and I had I had Kayla from uh, Top Team. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Actually, I saw uh, they, they flicked the camera to Kayla, and she's just staring intensely at you for the finish. And then you got the finish, and she's still just staring intensely. I was waiting for her to like jump up and go, "Yeah!" I was like, "She's just like intense, right? Just staring." <laughs> she's like, 
Yeah, yeah, that's right, Michelle. Well done. Yeah, I like it's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like um, she's such a passionate person, right? And so, like, she's looking like watching it as if it's me, like, say, sparring on someone and thinking she's thinking as she's watching, you know, she's not just like crazy motion here and there. It's like there's a lot of like thought behind um, where she's at. So, yeah, so I, I, I saw that too, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's exactly what I would expect, like, her to be intently watching, like, fuck, has she got it? Like, this that and the other and then uh yeah good but then afterwards you know she was she was stoked so that was cool but she was it it was a sense of confidence that gave me that the way she acted like she wasn't surprised and like you know that's what you like should have happened it made me feel like oh yeah cool (laughs) in in that in that environment you mentioned you can hear the you can hear your corner you can hear the other corner i I heard recently mentioned that uh some of the ckb guys were saying that they they call numbers in in terreo um the the maori language that's kind of interesting concept. I've never really thought of that before, but do you do anything like that to kind of disguise uh, what, what you're talking or what the corner's talking or it's just straight up sort of normal, normal uh, uh, advice? For, for us, we didn't in this fight. Um, in my last IMAF fights with Carlo, because he's known me since my very first time I ever stepped in a gym was his gym. So we have, we have things that we know are like, like gonna help me succeed in a fight and so he gets he has little ways to deal with that so in the IMAF we did um but usually you're finding someone with a completely different language at IMAF so you usually say um so yeah we we do other we have other cues for that stuff or there'll be things I'll like really want him to remind me of like in the moment like when if I if I start to lose track of it and I'll just say to him like can you just say these keywords like when I'm doing this and that or or the other Um, But for this fight for the PFL, we didn't have anything, um, nothing like secret language or whatever. It was basically like, we're confident that if I did the things that we wanted to do, like they could give me a quick reminder about it. But it wasn't like this crazy, like technical big plan. You know what I mean? Like we had a few ways to get in, a few ways to touch up. And then, um, and once we closed the distance, we were were pretty confident that um, I'd be able to finish from there. So, um, so it wasn't like we needed like this big, crazy, big game plan. It wasn't like it was a big striking battle. Like it never was going to be either. Um, so yeah, for this, it wasn't really something that we had to worry about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's actually, it's kind of cool of it. In the, in the last week I've had, uh, you're my second IMMAF champion. I uh, just had Fergus Jenkins on with Carl Weber the oh, other day. Yeah. I didn't quite put it out, but obviously be familiar with him, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I actually, I can't, I think I had just heard of the kid um, in NZ because he fought someone else that I knew better, Hux. But I remember he beat him, uh, Fergus did. And I, but I, I, I think that was the first time I'd really heard him because he's down south, you know, we're in different islands and that there. And he is a quiet boy on the socials. So, um, but then once I started talking to him at the week at Worlds, I was like, he's just such a, like, bless him, man. He's such a nice, humble like gentle soul who just rips heads off yeah man he did very well and and you coming off the same you previously took the world championships in 2019 um what they were saying it's quite a good um competition for everyone because you know normally you have to wait so long for fights but you have the experience of being able to you know put a few fights together and gain that experience which is the best for an amateur fighter right absolutely like in these in these events you can get well one if you don't win to four if you do win fights back to back in a row you know what I mean within five days you can have four fights and yeah back home in New Zealand especially for females you wouldn't get that you'd be lucky to get that in two years so people in Australia and New Zealand you would have fought everyone that you could possibly fight in your weight group if you're a female the boys yeah they have more options but again yeah to get everyone lined up and have people like not injured or with the COVID restrictions everything for these boys to go out there and get the get that experience in that in that one week is like there's it's nothing else like that it's kind of nothing priceless else. and and at the same time like you touched on it's people from different parts of the globe right so you get to experience those different feels because they're not yeah. you know in new zealand you're probably going to have some little bit of a similarity but you go like you mentioned before getting against someone from the eastern Bloc or kazakhstan or something it's going to be a whole different yeah. feel so that like i said it's priceless right yeah and that's exactly yeah yeah Hey, uh, I, I have listened to a bit of your your podcast to see, but but just wanted to quickly talk about your up, upbringing and your start in sports. So you grew up in a rural sort of area, by the sound of it. Uh, kicked off into from rugby, uh, inspired a little bit by Ronda Rousey into MMA. Is that correct? 
Yeah, I don't know if it was inspired, but it's definitely uh, what I was. I'd never heard of like mixed martial arts or anything like that there. Like, I, like you said, I grew up on a farm playing with animals and rugby and go karts and all that redneck stuff. So, for, and, and there was not even like any kind of martial arts in my little town of Matamata. So, let alone like stumbling upon it. And then I, yeah, I happened to be watching uh, just YouTube and like some popular video popped up. I was like, oh, what is this? Oh, what's this chick? Oh, okay. Oh, I'm built like her. What's she doing? What the fuck is this? I love this. <laughs> it's been I literally, yeah, like so when I as soon as I uh, got the chance, I Googled like MMA gym near me and Carlo's one in Hamilton caught MMA popped up is like, you know, 45 minutes away. And I was like, boom, straight in there, like called him what I need to bring. He's like, nothing. And I was like, oh, okay. Like I'm thinking like I need all this gear and shit. He's like, just show up. And uh yeah, show it up and then he just never got rid of me. That's awesome. So from the from day dot it was like uh an obsession, you just felt really into it. Yeah. Yeah, just um, like how can you get bored when there's there's so many uh, variables that you can't ever know everything. Um, coming from a sport like rugby where every training is different, you're working on a different staff, like it's and you're working with other against other people, tackling people. Like for me to go into that kind of sport, like it ticks so many boxes. Um, yeah, it, like for the longest time at the start, I was doing both sports at the same time. You know what I mean? So uh, it, I was still in love with both of them um and so it just took a while there to have uh, enough injuries where I was like no I just gotta stick to one and just put my eggs in that basket and did did you uh like what, at what stage do you see it as something you want to actually like move towards as a career or or um is it still not what you're thinking as a career or is that is that your goal in life now just to be a being a martial artist and an MMA fighter uh so I'm not one for hobbies like I do something um like <laughs> I do say and I'm just like I'm like all on that so for me I wanted to like before that I wanted to play rugby and represent New Zealand and you know make the like get in there with the, the when they were going to make it professional or semi-professional for our, um, our rep teams and that uh, it wasn't when I was playing and then uh, and then after those injuries I, I stopped anyway but so when I was um, training you know jiu-jitsu wrestling and, and doing these competitions and that um, I uh, I was never just doing it because oh this is a bit of fun like no I'm way too intense of a character to be doing anything just for a bit of fun unless we're playing like chess like no <laughs> anything that competitive like and even chess isn't fun if I'm losing so um, yeah so I was doing it at, from the very start like to do it for like a long time and I, I truly believe that I could you know fight overseas and keep growing and getting better and you know make a couple bucks from it which is what if you're gonna stop doing your day job or like stop helping your family business or whatever making those sacrifices then you best be like focusing on this enough where you can make some bucks off it or what is the point I mean yes you gotta love it which I do obviously um but that's not enough you need to be able to support yourself support your family um you know you need to be able to do that so um I had always um wanted that and obviously, I've only had the one profile in the PFL, so it's like <laughs> certainly not there yet. But undefeated, um, yeah. you're undefeated as a pro. <laughs> so it sounds good. Keep it that way. <laughs> oh nah. Well, <laughs> it was a couple of years, and I'll, then I'll chant that out. Yeah, but yeah, it is, true. Keep it in, uh, <laughs> what it is, but um, but yeah, obviously that is the goal to be able to just do this routine that I am doing now, but you know, not be. Um, not feeling so temporary with my location and all that, like just to be like, yep, yeah, cool. This is where I, this is my place where I live. This is my, all that there. Um, and, and just be settled and, and not, not worrying. Like, do I need to fly back home? Do I need to do this and that? Like, should I get an apartment? Should I just hold off? Like all these sorts of things. Like it will be good to finally be just like, nah, yeah, we're all good to go. Yeah. And um, just then you mentioned about the training, starting off training at core MMA, um, you've also trained at CKB. So just want to know, what's the difference between those two? Why do you cross over between gyms, et cetera? Um, so, so core MMA, obviously, that's always going to be my my family, my home, my the coach that's known me since day dot. Um, and uh, from head to toe, we know our ins and outs in that there. Um, everyone's super respectful with everyone and, like, there's never been any – any weirdness there um i i needed for me but to move further away from my hometown and be training with 
a bigger group of females that are fighting um, and be able to train throughout the day and night instead of just me working um, in the in the morning because I was living so close to home. Like, you know, it's only a 40 minute drive. So I'm always going to help out at work. Like, I just can't help myself. So helping out the family business and then driving over and training at the night. Um, I didn't seem to really get out of that routine. I did a little bit where I'd stay in the city there and I'd, I'd do, you know, the the what was on offer for the morning and lunch and all that there as well for a couple of days. But I was still like half and half in the schedule and it gets to the point where you know the girls that you're going to fight are going to be full-time just training. Uh, so for a couple of those camps here, um, our family business like basically like was able, we were able to work something out there where I was able to live up in Auckland, work with the coaches and training partners at City and have this whole group of girls that are training full-time that'll be there from morning, lunch, night time um, that I could train with. So it sort of worked out best in those kind of ways, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's a great gym. Yeah, I dropped down just to have a look when I was traveling, and uh, yeah, it was such a great group there. Like so many, so many uh, good, good quality. Um, I, I don't know if they're all fighters, but when I walked in, I watched the sparring class, and it was like packed from the ra- to the rafters of high quality yeah. people, you know. And the funny thing <laughs> was, which I mentioned in another interview, I'm there looking over. I know Dan Israel, and those guys are there. But if you didn't know who they are, they're not the ones standing out. It's just everyone's quite high quality. Everyone. You know what I mean? So it's like, definitely a good quality gym, yeah. I mean, go there and have girls like Gina and Jenna and Baby, like Nareen, like there's, yeah, they're all different sizes, but there's still like four of them my size. And that's, that's hard. That's hard to find the bigger girls. Um, and they're like world-class strikers, you know, and like fighting on these bigger MMA stages. So to be able to train with them and, um, throughout the day and for the whole week for me like um, that was awesome mentally and physically um, and obviously like over here to have a massive group of girls uh, and to be able to train full-time as well um, and I just I love Florida man it's a it's a such a cool place yeah it's interesting I want to ask that question like um, the ATT is obviously a super well-known gym uh, wondering if like in in New Zealand obviously smaller country I don't know if it's really a smaller gym because because you look at CKB, it's so big now. But is there any, some people say like the, the reason for not traveling overseas is that if you're training in like New Zealand, Australia, you know, you're the, you're the, you're going to get more attention. Uh, whereas you go over there, you're like a small fish in a big pond. You don't get as much attention from coaching staff, et cetera. What do you feel about that? Is it, is it like that there or you don't feel that? That's a really interesting question. Um, obviously having trained at core, we're like, uh, I'm kind of the only female MMA fighter. There's other girls that have done striking and and, and comps of other stuff, but um, so you know you're like you're a, maybe a like there's not they're always training with the boys and that there's so you're the you're the only girl in that sense. And you got a city and you're one of like heaps of girls. And those obviously you got your two head coaches there, huge and Doug, and they've got fifty odd you know pro fighters with something every week going on. Um, and then you go to ATT and it's this giant, like massive super center. And, uh, but there's obviously for every athlete, there's more coaches than just the, the two, you know what I mean? So um, I've been lucky, like when I came, um, I, and I think it was my second day or whatever, um, Mike Brown was like, oh, do you want to come do drilling with Kayla? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. Like, fuck yes. <laughs> I'll gain so much from that. And that's good to be a body, you know? So um, I've been blessed in that sense to be able to be, you know, working with, you know, the best in the world there and then having um, such a good coach like that there, um, you know, coaching her and then me alongside that as well to get those extra stuff in there. So I've actually, I've actually, I don't know if I've lucked out or what, but I've been able to get in, in any help that I've needed or coaches will offer this session or that session and, even if it's a massive like Muay Thai, Muay Thai class and there's 60 people in it on the on the big mat, like there's never been a class where I haven't had, you know, one of the coaches coming over and helping me with stuff. Like there's never been one. So um, I think they know the people that maybe need more help in certain areas and they'll make sure that they gravitate to them a little bit more in these sessions. Um, and then when it's a big, say, sparring or grappling or whatever, they like they know they can step back a little bit and like watch from afar and pick what they need to pick. But yeah. And those like drilling classes like that, they're there. They know who to help out more uh, in that sense. 
Yeah, and and um, like Dan mentions, that one of the best things about being a, a fighter has been, you know, being able to travel around and meet great people, and you know, experience different things. And um, I, I guess that's that's a benefit too, right? Like apart from being able to train at a at a big gym over there that's world renowned with great partners and stuff, uh, you're also getting to be in a different country. You know, you're from a rural small area now. You're in a completely different culture, a country. I mean, learning new things and meeting new people. That must be a bit of a benefit, right? Yeah, man. Like we are not in the Waikato anymore. That's for sure. Um, like it's uh even just the driving around places it's like you just know as soon as you step out the door we're in a different place but to go to the gym like that there's it's there's like the a big group of like russians um there's like the dagestani ones and the other like other russians and then there's the massive massive group of brazilians and then there's you know americans that have come over from other states and then there's maybe like uh half a dozen of us that are from uh, other countries around the world, like, you know, other bits and pieces, UK, Poland, New Zealand, um, an Aussie girl went over there, Erin Carter, the other girl I fought as well. She'd been over there for a while as well. So, um, so it's, it's really cool in that sense. And, and though some of them, you know, speak no English and you might do like a whole half a, like a half a training session with them, but you just, you just crack on and get, get your stuff done without needing to speak it. So, um, yeah it's um i I really like that aspect of it and and you become a better training partner for that as well because you have to communicate in in different ways than saying yeah nah good (laughs) yeah (laughs) actually the just wondering if the what's the feeling in the gym like uh like ckb it's a big family right like lots of people all you know working together towards a common sort of thing but if you're in a gym like ATT from what you're explaining it sounds like it would be a little more competitive a little bit more maybe not as tight knit as it would be in in CKB is that right it's uh, I think it's a fair thing to think it would be like but I have experienced the opposite um I don't know if it's because it, it like if it's the girl group thing but I feel like I felt so welcomed by the coaches. Like every day they'll walk in, even if they're with someone, they'll glance over and say good morning, they'll shake your hand, give you a hug, whatever. Like every single day, no matter, no matter what. Um, and then obviously with the with the girls group as well, um, you know, we always train at the same end together. We've got a smaller group of the bigger girls. Like I I really feel like um, you know, a family with them. We we're in there tonight. Um uh, you know, after drilling session, and then there was Kayla and other Kayla and Jordana. Um, one of the girls was cutting weight and you know I'm just laying there watching just like for me I'm like oh I would always do that one of the girls is cutting weight you're just in there with them like um, supporting them just giving them that energy that moral support you know Um, and she would do the same for us as well so it's um, it definitely feels like a a family for for me Um, uh, maybe because I I like seek that um, so I get it back I don't just do my own thing and get out I like actually have those personal conversations so I allow that um, that that family side of it to to come into play. Yeah, that sounds cool. Um, the yeah. so talking about you mentioned Kayla Harrison. I heard in another interview you mentioned Brad Riddell as being like a kind of uh, someone to look up to. Uh, yeah. What other sort of uh, well known you could say stars of MMA or other fighting arts have you worked with and or look up to that you've had sort of close contact with between CKB and also um, ATT. <laughs> Um, well, there's one at Court MMA, Matt Vale, who um, has won every belt under the sun in Australasia. He, um, his work, his work ethic, and his like banter and always positive attitude, but just absolute savagery as well. Um, and just knowing how much of a champ he is as well. Like um, for me, I'm like, okay, that is someone who, in their fighting and their personal, and like still owns his own business and does that during the day as well. Like. And he, I've never once heard him complain in my life. Like, that's the kind of guy I'm like, oh, yeah, that's that, like, Brad Riddell energy um, as well, like, like heaps of those other boys. But, yeah, but Matt Vale for sure is one of those people. And, like, he's similar to me on a night out as well. We're just absolute psychos. So, <laughs> <laughs> so like, I'm like, okay, he's, like, my spirit animal. Um, obviously, yeah, obviously Kayla as well and, like, um, just the kind of person she is um, outside of training and, and how much of a good training partner she is and, and was, like, obviously taking in her kids and stuff. Like, I'm just like, yeah, she is uh, pretty superhuman, that uh, that woman. Um, 
yeah but I, there's there's he, there's bits and pieces of so many people that I meet that I'm like wow I really want to like embrace that or take in part of that or be around that more often um and yeah I couldn't name all the people that I see something in that I really admire when, when you look at uh like the current crop of fighters especially the champions in mm-hmm. UFC who who do you aspire to be sort of like or or emulate in a way Honestly, no one. I'm a hundred percent my own thing. Like I'm, I, and I know that sounds corny or whatever, but I really, I really am different to them all in like many ways. Like the way I fight, or the way I talk, or just my, I, like my mental state, probably in, in lots of different ways as well. Um, but if I have to sit here and pick one, uh, if you want, I mean, Volk's a good cunt, so you can't go wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> like he's the most relatable for me you know like yeah, yeah. And, and I like that there and, and the nitty grittiness of him and um there's no bullshit there. right hey no there's exactly no bullshit, right and he, yeah. he pulls a spade a spade you know what I mean he just it is what it is um the same kind of attitude as Dan Hooker you know what I mean like they it is what it is they don't sugarcoat or bullshit it they're just like fuck that's what it is um so like I really love that attitude as well um yeah, I just like the humble ones, the real ones uh, that if you meet, like when you have a conversation with them at training or outside of like, you know, media or bright lights and stuff, they're just the same person, you know what I mean? And you can just crack on with them well. Yeah, that's good, man. Hey, the, yeah. you mentioned that you did three training sessions today. Uh, is that like a normal uh, training schedule for you or are you coming up towards another bout or what's the what's your what how do you configure your training at the moment yeah so no that's normal for me two to three sessions a day um seven days day. or will you have a break six days six days um yeah um that's it yeah rest on a sunday but yeah um monday to saturday is two to three sessions a day yeah and uh yeah that's that's how it is <laughs> And how does, that, how does that change when you're going towards a fight or when you're not in a fight sort of preparation mode? Um, so right now I'm like in a weird in-between, a good in-between, um, here, waiting to hear back from the PFL if I get uh, a contract with them. So we'll find out um, by the end of the second week of April. So I'm obviously, I can be a little bit heavier, like heavier for lightweights, not heavy, but you know, whatever. Um, I can be you know, eating a bit more, have that couple of beers and eat, have the extra calories and whatever that I want, the little chockies and stuff. Um, but the training's the same. Um, when I'm prepping, obviously I've got the fight dietitian that keeps my energy up anyway. So I still get to eat a shitload anyway um, for this weight for sure. But the, the difference sushi, probably... Yeah. Would... Still smashing out <laughs> the sushi or what? <laughs> oh, tall, dirty. Yeah. That is the one. <laughs> I have so much fucking sushi. It's not funny. Um <laughs> Just rice, rice and meat. Yep. Boom. Um, but no, so obviously when I'm coming closer to a fight, it's going to be, we're not going to be doing just like random sessions here and there. Um, it'll be more fine tuned in the sense of what we're working towards for that fight. Um, more pad sessions, um, more one-on-one sort of drilling style sessions as well. Um, and the, obviously the strength and conditioning block will change from, you know, us kind of gaining strength and power right now to more short burst stuff um closer to the time um but again that's something that with the resources around me right now I'm, I'm lucky to have people that can help help plan that out with me yeah talking about you just mentioned about opponents i watched uh, a couple of your fights one of them being that one in 2021 with uh, i think her name was the suso or something um, she looked like super sharp in the stand-up area. Anything that you gained from that? I mean, what did you gain from that fight and what do you look to improve to be able to take someone like that in future? Um, in that fight there, I fought the opposite stance. I'd injured my leg in the first day, so I was uh, I didn't need to fight like how I would have wanted to. Yeah. But again, I had chance to fight at the World Champs and I fought how I wanted to and she still won the decision. You know, I fought better, you know, took her down, had time on the ground but and it was more back and forth but yeah she's busy she's hard to catch and uh I'm a big girl <laughs> so in my eyes compared to uh compared to like she fought she just she last fought at bantamweight so I fought down at feather and fought her there but uh yeah that's a fast person to catch so I think it's more just um just getting busier you know um 
would probably be it. And, and that was the my first fight ever that's been like that, just boom, 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 boom. Um, so, yeah, that would probably be the main thing. But, you know, the second fight I had with it, I was, I was pretty wrapped with, like, um, how I fought anyway. So, you know, and that's the that's my two losses is, is, is my fights of her. So, and that's for a reason, you know what I mean? Like, it's not like the first one was just bad luck. It was like, no, nah, we fought again even, and, like, I couldn't pull it out. So, you know. Would you say, like, obviously your, I mean, what I would say is your strength is, the wrestling, I mean, and ground fighting, because you've got a lot of experience, Oceania wrestling champ, New Zealand Commonwealth Games, many grappling comps, multiple champion in different grappling comps. Um, yeah. She, she, her strength was obviously the stand-up. So is that something that you feel like you can improve the most is the stand-up area or, or is that wrong? No, no, you're right. They're true. Exactly right. Like you, you go um, through your early few years every weekend doing jiu-jitsu comp wrestling comp whatever you look at the amount of hours that that adds to your like to your experience of either competing or, or your skills in those in those aspects of MMA um and if like me you didn't you didn't come through doing those um those stand-up fights um in those earlier earlier stages then you look at someone that has and like you know there's a difference there but um the program that they've got through KHK Bahrain with those athletes you know, getting them in there at a young age, training them full time, flying them around the place for all these comps. Like they don't have to work; they just get to train. Like they're developing so fast, and it's so exciting to see them. Like those Bahrain kids, just like some of them are adults now too, and they just absolutely smash everyone. Um, like she is, like she is going to be a actual proper star. That girl. Yeah, man, that, she looked amazing. Actually, I hey, um. Back to your to your training, you mentioned about Jordy, uh, the fight dietitian, and and uh, there are so many different things people are doing now with professional MMA. What other sort of things are you doing to add that little one percent? You know, focusing on rest. You mentioned strength and conditioning too, recovery, things like that that you do to you know just take care of your body, give you that extra little bit that you might not have had in the old days when they didn't use, didn't know all those things. You know. Um. So my favorite one is getting floats in. Um, I was introduced to that by lifestyle physiotherapy in Hamilton in New Zealand. And, um, and honestly, that for me has changed my recovery. Uh, I don't know whether it's because my brain is always just going so hard or whatever, but to get in there and force yourself to just stop thinking at any time of the day, it could be 10 a.m., could be 12 or 2 p.m., whatever. And uh, trying to make yourself either sleep or just fully relax, you floating, there's no sound noise, nothing around you, all the magnesium in there as well and those epsom salts just it's so good for your body too like um that one for me because i started off like i've just had like in the times of my past i've just been i've gotten like whether it was anxious or stressed or just depressed like like often enough that it was really like annoying so to have something like that there that would just reset me and just be the my like me time uh for me is the the number one uh then after that would be physio and massage uh so I try to get that try very hard to get it once a week but it's a hard one to fit in the schedule and you want to get it at the right timing of the day but I've got that locked in for once a week I do that there uh help sort any niggles out um massage gun I like to do um when I get like a bit of a niggle that I gotta sort out in between those massages um and obviously the sleep side of it having the having the trainings a little bit later in the morning for me is a big one because like I'm a bit of a like I like to stay out watching you know a bit of Peaky Blinders or whatever and having a having a late night bit of food and that there so for me to have a training that's my training day to start a bit later in the morning like I I hit that first training and I'm not tired I'm just like I'm boom like I'm I'm, I'm super super good to go yeah so the sleep part of it in the schedule is very good. Yeah, yeah, it's a hectic schedule, so maybe you need to make yeah. those adjustments sometimes, right? Like it's a, it's a lot on your body. I can't even like I, I don't know if you know a guy called Colby Thickness. We talk quite a bit online, and uh, and he's, you yeah. will talk to me. Ah, what do you do this week? You'll talk list out his Monday training. His Monday schedule is like my whole week schedule. You know, like the differences of being professional <laughs> and being a, just a casual. <laughs> I was literally looking at my diary last week and I had my book there, and I was like, okay, how much many hours did I put in this week? Because you know, I'd come off my fight. I had a week of kind of like a couple of trainings and stuff, but like, you know, and then I had a boom for a week and I was like, holy shit, like that was, whew. and I looked at the hours and I was like, man, we need to get more recovery in there if that's going to be our like work hours, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, it's a good problem to have 
it's a good problem to have. Um, it's just balancing it, balancing like, it all out. But yeah, I did look at that and thought, there's just no way you could fit in a a, uh, a nine to five or even any kind of like job in there. Really, like I yeah. don't know, you just can't. Must interrupt everything, right? Like from from uh, yeah, you can't. You obviously, if you're going to be really committed, you can't work a job maybe difficult. Uh, if yep. people have children will be very hard and then the, the third oh. part will be relationships and things like that it must be quite difficult when you've got that sort of schedule you've got to really focus on yourself and your training and you yeah. don't have much time for anything else so. yeah that's exactly it like the people with kids like even like Kayla right she'll she'll get them all ready for school and then she'll and then she'll come and train and then she'll pick them up she'll do take them to after school practice and she'll coach their sport she'll come and do drilling for an hour or two hours and like and then go home and like that's her that's her day. I'm like, man, I'm tired, not even with the kid factor. I looked after my friend's kids for the weekend and I was fucking wrecked. Like <laughs> I was so gone. Cause just like you are just like, I hope they're okay, like looking after them, feeding them, like just like normal parent stuff. But I'm not a parent. So for me, it was like, this is I'm just trying to do everything right. And so like someone like obviously her that does that every day, plus on top of all her other commitments, is um very admirable. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, um, I just kind of thinking, you know, obviously you guys are at a very high level of physical fitness. You've also trained rugby, et cetera. So you'd have a lot of advice for people. And I just kind of like some advice for people that are training, uh, learning training or just starting training uh, or wanting to stay healthy. What are some of the tips you'd give people for, you know, for training, maybe not necessarily to a pro level, but just to, you know, to get to the gym, get to the MMA gym, et cetera, and, and, and what they should do to maintain general sort of health, you know? The main, the number one part, honestly, is as annoying as people don't want to hear it. It's just like fixing part of your diet up because it just accounts for so many things. Like for me, when I'm eating like poop, I get tired. I don't want to train, and then I don't train, and then then I'm sad the next day because I didn't train, and then I eat like shit, and like it's a little cycle. So I think the number one thing for people is just like pick one thing in your in your day that you just know every day when you have it you don't feel good and just like swap it out for something better or drop it or whatever you need to do like you know ask a professional but like swap that one thing out and you'll just feel so much better from that one change and then in terms of like getting the motivation for the training or the gym or, or whatever it is figure out go back and like don't just force yourself figure out what it is that makes you not want to go whether it's the energy or the sleep or the kids or the partner or I feel subconscious in my clothes, whatever it is, find that one thing and then fix that. And then you'll be able to continue on it and then start attacking these little mini goals you have with the health and the training and that there. But it's honestly finding out why it makes you nervous or not want to go, addressing that. And then you'll have no, like, you'll have nothing holding you back. Yeah, no, that's good. And the the diet, man, like it's a, it's amazing the difference it can make, right? Like a, if I cut out all the crappy sugar and everything within a few weeks, I'd probably say for me, it's about a three week time. My mental clarity just changes completely. Yeah. I don't think people know because there's so much sugar in fucking everything. So if you, if you oh, somehow yeah. take it out, it just changes your whole mindset. You can think clearly. It's yeah. just a weird thing. You know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like I, on Sunday afternoon, I ate like it's American stuff, but a turkey leg and a funnel cake, like pretty heavy stuff my ankles just blew up I felt wrecked I was even more tired the next day like my I put on like four kgs holding water from just like this one afternoon of just letting the, I mean like, that's fine you know it's all good but I just keep tabs on that because I'm like oh that's like <laughs> that's a heavy Monday <laughs> and just on one other point um you you've done rugby which is obviously a pretty uh heavy sport in a way uh you've fought yep. wrestling grappling MMA how do you prepare psychologically for your fights? Like, does it affect you? Do you feel scared? How do you deal with any sort of fear or, or doubt? Um, I, looking back at every fight, and I think, what, 15 of them or 14, um, and plus all the grappling matches in that there, I don't think I ever get scared is not the feeling. Um, there's other things in life that, that scare me, um, like driving in Florida. But, like, the... I think like the the feeling I get. Well, they're on the I, wrong side of the road, aren't they? That's the problem. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's fine. It's just the like, constant lane changing, how fast they go, and just like, just it's like, man, don't even get me stuff. But anyway, the uh, I think the main thing is like for me, I know that no matter what I feel during the week, before I walk out, I'm gonna have that feeling in my in my guts. Like, mm -hmm. and no matter what, it's gonna come. 
So during the week, like the build up week is, is tricky because you're not busy. You're not busy every day with your normal training routine. You're kind of sitting around, you're a little bit of weight cutting, media stuff, like travel. You, you're kind of twiddling your thumbs for a, enough of it where you're like, you start to get in your head. So for me, I'm like, whenever that happens, I just push it away because I hate the adrenaline like pumps through the legs before it's time. So I push that away and then I know come fight day, I'm going to feel it anyway. And then, it, yeah, there it is. When, like, when my hands are getting wrapped, go to walk out like like a bit a couple hours later like that's that's that feeling in me but i'm like oh it's too late to do anything about it now i'm already walking in the cage so whatever <laughs> yeah yeah that's good man and, and obviously the putting the work in is a part of it too right like you, you're working hard enough that you can be confident in in you know that you're ready yeah and and i think the two the thing is that being so confident in your in your preparation but also for people that maybe haven't fought mma yet or have had a couple fights but they get nervous like for me doing um jiu-jitsu tournaments or wrestling tournaments or whatever um mentally prepares every time I do those comps I'm using that as like mental preparation because you get the chance to calm yourself physically warm yourself up get ready either listen to coaches or do it on your own whatever your case is um and you get to practice being in that competition mindset without there being really you know, there's nothing to lose, you know. You, Not quite you, the you, same you, consequences to it, right? Like you can get, obviously you can oh. get a limb broken or something or potentially a bad yeah. injury, but you're not getting someone like, smashing you in the face. Yeah. <laughs> but like those things aren't that likely, you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. especially at least, you know, know what you're doing to a certain extent. Um, so for me, that's the biggest thing is, is those mental reps of all those years of doing those competitions, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, so just uh, one last thing. Just want to know, like, what's your plans for 2022 and for the future? Um, so obviously pending what we hear back from uh, PFL in a couple of weeks, but what I would like is obviously to get that uh, contract there and be able to fight um, three, uh, two more times or three more times this year um, for the PFL and then do the same next year, you know, three or four fights next year with them in this contract and then... Um, hopefully then be ready for uh for the regular season but yeah to fight on the uh, fight on their prelims and undercards for this next year and a half would be um ideal for me um growing in the professional uh professional experience there yeah and long term have you set a long term goal we'll see we'll see <laughs> Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Hey, uh, on the on the PFL, I heard you mention that you uh, you weren't sure how you how you actually got into the PFL because someone asked you that in an interview. And um, is it is it to do with Ray Sefo and his relationship, obviously with uh, Balmora Liga, who's then linked to CKB, who's obviously linked to other people as well? Is it is it because of that relationship that quite a few Kiwis are on the show? Like I watched BJ um, last week, unfortunately picked up a loss, but uh, you know, warrior as it is anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it wasn't that I didn't know. It's more like, I, I mean, I don't know really where it came about as mm. such, but I know that, uh, I know you had a text last year in August before I went for that Russia fight, um, from Ray Sefo about it, but obviously I was, I was fighting at featherweight in a week or two's time. It was like, well, there's no point. So, uh, and then I did get a message from one of the PFL guys when I was at, uh, in Ireland after being in the States last year. So in about, I think it was November, end of November, I got a text um, asking, I think they got in touch with someone at ATT at that point or maybe, yeah, something like that. So that's why I'm like, oh, it went like through this way or it was this way and then it ended up getting to me and then I was able to have those conversations. Um, so yeah, it was cool. Cool, cool. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much for your time and uh, I hope, Hope to speak with you in the future, maybe before or after one of your upcoming fights. And uh, yeah, wishing you best of luck. Cool, mate. And I love the backdrop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hope that one's all right. I like that. Cool, cool.